Welcome to Our Justice Journey, a podcast designed to educate others on how to fight for social justice as a youth and beyond. Today we'll be interviewing social justice warrior, Dr. Roger Watson. Dr. Roger Watson is a scholar, activist, faculty director, and a professor of educational leadership and racial justice in the College of Education at Sacramento State University in Sacramento, California. Watson has over 20 years of experience as a teacher, community organizer, and researcher. She is the founder of Sacramento Area Youth Speaks, says, an award-winning program that pairs community-based poet mentor educators and teachers together to develop grassroots pedagogies that reclaim and reimagine schooling. She is the sole author of two books, Learning to Liberate, Community-Based Solutions for the Crisis in Urban Education, written in 2012, and Transformative Schooling Towards Racial Equity in Education in 2018, and has published dozens of peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. Watson is originally from Berkeley, California, and was deeply impacted by the courses she took in uh, Black and Hikonic Studies departments at Berkeley High School in the mid-1990s. In 10th grade, her final exam question was, what are you doing to stop and or curtail the spread of white supremacy in yourself, community, and this world? This question still shapes her path and purpose. Today, she'll be speaking with us about her role as a white woman in fighting for social justice and equity. Dr. Roger Watson is an advocate and organizer for social justice and continues to fight for change throughout her everyday life. All right, so thank you so much for being on this podcast. I'll start with the first question. So do you believe that there is one pathway to do social justice work that is most influential? Mm, I think the most influential way to do such social justice work is to be really intuitive to your own needs and values and voice. So I firmly believe that we all have purpose. And so part of that social justice work is really finding out who you are, what are your roots, what do you embody, and how do you then like live out and fulfill the best part of yourself. So when we say like, do you, that is part of social justice work and justice will materialize like in the world differently for each person. So it's not about like trying to be Malcolm X, it's about trying to be you, even though Malcolm X might be, you know, someone that you admire and idolize, you know, he also is, was, you know, a human being. And so part of his power was him knowing himself and then being able to shine his light on the world. And so part of justice is doing just that. Thank you for saying that. Um, I think that also speaks to one of our next questions, which is what does justice look like in different forms? Like how can social justice manifest itself differently in people's lives? You know, that's, it's a good question. You know, I feel like when I was, um, younger when I was in high school I was like there is one way you know it's like bow down or be brought down type of mentality and you know very very kind of self-righteous in the sense of like you're either like doing justice or you're not you know at the same time I look at um Ibrahim Kendi's work that's gotten really popular around like how to be an anti-racist and he's like well either someone is a racist or they're not racist, like there there are no in-between spaces. And so I do think that there has to be a conviction to stand, you know, for what's right, you know what I mean? And a conviction that if you're an engineer, you're not just in being an engineer um, and seeing yourself as an inventor, but you are inventing for social impact. Yeah. Not just, you know, like, personal achievement, but collective accountability. Like, are you leaving this earth better than you inherited it? And how do you know? Yes. So that's what I think gets into like the next layer. So let's say, you know yourself, the next layer is how do you then manifest a career that allows you to serve humanity? Um, And some careers allow that easier than others, but all of them have the potential to be of service. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so speaking specifically to the youth, um, what would you say that you saw in the youth that made you want to be part of SES? 
Mm, so for, for the work in says, I was just coming off of my dissertation, my doctoral research. And what I was doing there is I was looking at community-based educators who work effectively um, with young people. And so I knew that I wanted to try to apply that uh, wherever I went, you know, and I came to UC Davis, so I was in the Sacramento region, but I knew like one of the groups that I worked with in the Bay for a number of years called United Players, they're a violence prevention program. It wasn't just about taking United Players and superimposing it to the youth of Sacramento because every place matters, right? It got to be organic to the neighborhood and to the needs. And so when I got to UC Davis and started really like spending time in Sacramento, one of the things that was happening at the time in like 2008, nine, is there was a California high school exit exam and black and brown youth in Sacramento were not passing it and they weren't passing the, the English component. And so I was kind of debating with teachers and superintendents and I'm like, man, the youth know literacy. They might not know your literacy, mm -hmm. but they know literacy. And so that just got me, you know, spark to try to like facilitate a workshop, you know, see what the young people like had in mind. I made an old school, like flyer on eight and a half by 11, no social media, nothing. <laughs> um, went around to schools and passed out the flyer, like, oh, let's have a writing workshop, maybe do a little spoken word leadership. And really, I just wanted to understand how they were experiencing their education um, and the region, really. And then I just wanted 30, 30 youth to come. I kept telling myself it'll be like a little classroom. And then only five kids came after I flyered everywhere. Wow. But those five youth, they said that um, Sacramento was, was starving for youth voice. They didn't feel like they had an outlet for their voice to be heard. And... They're like, we about to make something happen. Like we're gonna spark a movement of youth voices for social change. And I was like, mm, I'm gonna have another meeting in one month. If y'all don't bring five friends, each of you, I'm never having another meeting. <laughs> I'm like, y'all like, only five kids. Like, what are we gonna do? And then at that, that meeting a month later, they brought 57 kids showed up. So they, those five kids organized and you know, says it's so big now. But it really just started with like five down youth, mm -hmm. you know, a somewhat crazy white lady from Berkeley. And, you know, we just, we stayed very determined to, um, to the, like the core values. And then I would say the other piece, you know, people would always say like, why well, I'm like, man, I fell in love with the youth of Sacramento. The youth of Sacramento, I think are um, real. I think that they're raw. I think the majority of the youth in Sacramento are unapologetic in who they are. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was born in the Bay, you know, we were sleeping on SAC. And now so many more people have migrated to Sacramento because like the Bay got so high, the cost yeah. of living got so high. And I have friends that I grew up with, they're now out this way, like SAC, mm -hmm. SAC might be where it's at where it's at and then I look at just all the youth youth performances we thank you for listening to part one of our justice journey with Dr. Vajra Watson to further listen to this discussion feel free to visit part two